Good morning and welcome to Wholesome Roots. This morning I am doing my first garden tour ever and I am so excited to take you along with me. So come check it out. and I'm gonna show you our raised bed gardens, our in-ground garden, and our front yard permaculture orchard. So those of you that have been with me for a little while know I like to do things different. And for those of you that are just joining us as new people watching our channel, let me tell you, I'm a little different. So one of the things I wanted to do differently is the garden tour video. So this garden tour video is going to be focused in on monitoring plants, and maintenance of these garden beds and the things that I do and some tips and tricks on how I keep my garden healthy I'm gonna show you while I show you what we're growing this year so I'm gonna start with the first raised bed here on the left and this is our spring greens mix this was just a bunch of different throwaway plants that we decided we were just gonna stick in here and see how they did not too bad but there are some issues that we've come across just like growing any brassica, we're going to have issues with caterpillar damage. So all of these holes in this kale and the holes in the cabbage are caused by caterpillars. So the first step of action that I do when I have caterpillar on my plants is I pick them off and I smoosh them. That is the first line of defense. If I can't keep it under control by removing them, and the population gets too large like it is now on this kale where nothing is left of those new leaves then i'm going to apply bt bt is a natural bacteria that only affects caterpillars so bacillus thuringiensis is the long name for bt and it is a very good effective organic pest control for caterpillars or worms as some people call them so sometimes you have to kind of look for these guys because they do hide, especially during the day. So this caterpillar right here is causing us lots of crop loss. When you're monitoring your garden, you're going to be paying attention to how much loss are you willing to accept. So set your mind of how much you're willing to lose to pests and how much becomes your breaking point where you have to start using pesticides. Organic, of course. So BT is real easy to use. The way that it works is once it's applied to the leaf and the caterpillar eats the leaf that has BT on it, it goes into their stomach and begins doing its damage from there. So it works from the inside out. So we have to make sure that when we are spraying, you may wanna wear gloves. I'm gonna wash my hands directly after. You're gonna wanna make sure you get the front and the back of the leaves and the most important part to make sure you get is that center growth because the caterpillars absolutely love that center new growth so just liberally apply to the entire plant all of its leaves front and back and that will help control the caterpillars but it won't harm your beneficial insects like this little guy right here. So if I was using anything other than BT, I'd be feeling really guilty right now because this guy just got soaked. And this is one of our beneficial ladybugs or Asian lady beetle in this case. Oops. So that is a good insect to have in the garden. And it's the reason why I'm not using a full spectrum pesticide. I'm using a target specific pesticide that will only take care of what I need it to and it won't harm other things in my garden. So I'm going to apply this to all of my cabbage and kale plants that are being eaten by caterpillars to make sure I get full coverage so the problem won't get worse again. So you will want to reapply your BT every five to seven days to make sure that it takes care of the young caterpillar. Once a caterpillar gets to be a full size, the BT doesn't work as well anymore, so it is important that you get them in the early stages. Even though there are a few caterpillar bites, I won't be spraying the Swiss chard because we are actually 
gonna be harvesting the Swiss chard for our dinner tonight. So with Swiss chard, this is a great cut and come again vegetable, which most of the leafy vegetables are. I am going to cut the outer leaves from each plant and leave the center growth for a future harvest. So I cut low to the ground at the base of the stem, nice clean cuts and some beautiful Swiss chard for dinner. Now, one of the things that I do while I'm in here collecting some good yummy Swiss chard, I cut out the yucky ones too and I add those to the compost or give them to the chickens or quail. When you do this cut and come again method on Swiss chard or kale or lettuce, you're not only benefiting your family with a wonderful meal, but it actually benefits the plant and can extend its growing season. When we cut the plants back heavily around the outer edges, we are telling that plant to keep producing more leaves. So it'll produce more leaves. When we don't cut it back, they often think that their destiny is over and they will try to produce a bloom and go to seed. So this kale right here is doing exactly that. It's going to seed. The flower has turned into seed pods that are maturing and as they get big and fat they will begin to dry out and we'll be able to harvest the seed from them. I like to let them go to bloom if I don't need the bed for something else right away because the blooms provide a lot of food for the pollinators and attract very beneficial insects and then they are edible as well if you want to put them in a salad to brighten it up it's beautiful yellow flowers and the seeds are also able to be harvested once they're mature so it's a win-win situation if I have the time and the space to leave them in I do else to keep an eye out for especially if you live in the south like we do here in Georgia is keep an eye out for any fire ants that are moving into your beds right now this is just a very small fire ant hill so it's not that big of a problem yet this is when you want to treat it what we use for treating fire ants is a <laughs> kitty cat no we don't use a kitty cat kitty you don't want to get bit by them we use a product called come and get it and it is a fire ant bait that uses spinosad which is a naturally occurring bacteria so it is also organic so it's safe to use in our vegetable gardens it's really easy to use you just put a little bit of it on top very gently trying not to disturb the hill and they will come out and eat it and bring it back to the nest and it'll take care of everything from there. It's very effective when the fire ant hills are small like this. And I find that if the fire ant hill is a little bit bigger than this or has gotten to be a large size, that it might take several applications. But it's definitely worth it to use an organic pesticide instead of one that will harm beneficial insects. So one of the cool things about this bed is this is a seasonal transition bed. So a lot of this stuff will be going out and going away because it's starting to get hot and I'll be able to plant new stuff in its place. Throughout the summer in Georgia, I'm able to plant beans, cucumbers, summer squash, and probably a few other things, but those three are like the standby true no matter what time of year, no matter how hot it is in the middle of the summer, you can put some of those seeds in the ground and they will come up and you will get a crop from it as long as you do it before August. Of course, people in other climates, it might be a bit different. Just look at how many days to maturity the seed has on it and you can count to your latest frost date and make sure that you have enough time to do so. For us, that means we can do it pretty late because we don't get a frost until late October at the earliest. All right, so this, obviously you can tell from the trellising system, is our bean bed. This is 
the three bean salad bed. We have three different colored beans. They're all coming up really good. I have a few empty spots on this side here where it looks like something might have come in and nibbled them down as they started to grow. So I'm gonna have to go back and look at the video and see which color bean that was so that I can pop a few more back in to fill in the gaps. The middle row down the center was going to be one of my favorite dragon tongue bean, but I guess my dragon tongue seeds were a little old because nothing came up on that row and I planted all of them in there pretty thick. So I'll either have to get more dragon tongue beans or possibly put a different type of green bean in there down the middle just to keep it nice and full and make sure we're using the optimum amount of our space. All right, now we have our other bean bed. These are more of the unique beans. These are new beans that I'm trying out. Um, and some of them actually aren't even beans. The middle row here is the Chinese red noodle bean, which lots of people have told me I'm gonna absolutely love and I'm really excited about. They're coming up really good, starting to get their secondary leaves in already. These ones closest to me are the winged bean and they are a little bit unique and I'm excited to try them out. In the front row is the really odd one. Those are snake gourds, so they're not actually a bean. They are a gourd, but when you pick them and harvest them like a bean, they are very delicious. I'm really glad that only five of those seeds germinated because I've been told that they get pretty big. So they might be a little too big for this bed, but hopefully they won't overtake it like a jungle. And if they do, then more for me. Then this bed, I put my cherished lemon squash. I love the lemon summer squash. It's a small, round summer squash tastes very much like a yellow crook neck or straight neck squash it is a fast growing and one of the nice things about it it is resistant it's not foolproof but it is resistant to the squash vine borer i have a few spots where multiple seeds came up so i will on a nice cool morning carefully divide those so that I can divide and conquer and move those to where some of them didn't take as well or even move them to a different bed. Something I'll also do while I'm doing my monitoring and going through the garden is I will deadhead my marigolds. Some of them, if they're too far gone and they're already starting to dry out, I will leave on the plant so that I can have seed because I will take some of those seed off and I will sprinkle them around the edges of the bed throughout the growing season and still get more marigolds before fall. Unfortunately, the zucchini and squash that I planted in these two beds did not take at all. So rather than planting more when the lemon squash came up so well, I was gifted some ground cherry plants. I really wanted to grow ground cherry, but I didn't get any seeds started in time. So I'm super excited to go ahead and fill in both of these beds with some beautiful ground cherries. One of our other gifts we received was some pumpkins. No idea what kind. And these are gonna go beautifully in this bed where they can trail off into the wild vegetation and take over this back corner with just a carpet of vines with pumpkins. This bed was our grocery store potato bed. You can see that not a lot has come up, but some has. So I'm going to just add a few things here and there in this bed. I've overseeded many of these beds with some summer flowers. So we'll see what comes up and just keep playing with this bed and make it our little experiment bed. Then we come to the one I'm really excited about. These are doing great. These are running okra, as Miss Elsie says, or otherwise known as angled loofah. So they are related to the loofah that you grow for a sponge, but generally if you're growing it for a sponge, you're gonna wanna use smooth loofah, which ends up being a much rounder, wider fruit when it dries out. And so you get more of the sponge inside. Whereas these 
running okra or Chinese okra. There's many different names and they will have ridges in them and they're also called ridge gourd. <laughs> they will have ridges in them like an okra and you will pick them small and eat them just like you do okra. Now you could leave them and let them go to seed and they will have a sponge like material on the inside of them but it won't be nearly as big as if you purposely grew the smooth loofah. I'm really excited about the sweet potato bed. This sweet potato bed was free sweet potatoes we got from the food bank. When they had too many and they didn't know what to do with them all, we said we'll take them and we'll try to distribute them or feed them to animals or what have you. And sure enough, we, we distributed as many as we could, gave away tons and still had tons left. I mean like pounds and pounds and pounds of sweet potatoes. So I said, let's plant them. I took the smaller baby size sweet potatoes and you can watch the video where we did the sweet potato bed and see how I did it. It's really cool. The experiment is definitely worthwhile. Way easier than trying to start my own slips, which is what I've done in years past. Then this section of the sweet potato bed is the slips that we got. These are uh, Vardamon sweet potatoes. So we will see how these do. These were started from slips, so they're taller and they're more singular growth. So we're gonna see. We'll be able to compare growing them from a whole potato versus a slip and see what our output and see what our final harvest is on those. Then we come to the amazing potato bed. <laughs> Looking at this now, I realize that I may have placed these a little too close together, but they're doing great and it is time to hill these potatoes. So hilling the potatoes means to cover up a portion of the stem. It doesn't have to be the whole stem. It can be part of the stem. It can be a little or a lot. But you can see these in the front are so tall that we're going to go a lot thicker with our compost layer on these ones than we will on the ones that are smaller next to it. One of the things we're going to do before we add that compost is we're going to put in some bone meal. This is going to help with root development and make sure that we get lots of potatoes come harvest time. One of the other things I was going to mention is these, this trellis is going to have um, stuff growing on it, but Ryan's going to build me some little square planters that I can put right at the base of each one of these so I can put a little bit of flowers. And then I think we're going to do, uh, what did I say, Ryan? Scarlet runner bean. Scarlet runner bean, yes. And I think that'll be beautiful over this trellis and it will help attract hummingbirds and butterflies and beneficial insects to our garden. And they're also edible. That brings us to the tomatoes. So the next couple of beds are going to be all about tomatoes. Super excited about this. Loving how well they're doing. If you take a look, they're just gorgeous. They're thriving. Everything is growing nice and big after getting that rain. And I just have to make sure that I monitor and maintain with these tomatoes. Some of the main things that I do when I'm monitoring my tomatoes is I look around the base of the plant and see if I see any frass. Frass is the poop of the caterpillar. So I am looking and looking for any caterpillar damage. We had a little bit of caterpillar damage on this leaf here and we never did find any caterpillars. So I'm hoping that it was just a small one and not a great big tomato hornworm that's gonna take over the whole garden. The other thing that I do is I look to see if my growing points are still inside the tomato cage. Sometimes I'll take a leaf from a lower one that I know is gonna outgrow soon and place it on the bar so that it will keep itself contained inside of each of their own little houses. You can see there's tons of tomato fruit setting on all of these cherry tomatoes. 
and I'm going to go ahead and give everybody a dose of fertilizer at this point. I have not fertilized anything other than the organic compost that we used. So I'm going to use my all-time favorite, Espoma Tomato Tone. It is what I have used for as long as I can remember. So it's been, it's been at least a decade of me using Tomato Tone. Before I start applying fertilizer and getting that on my hands, I am actually going to harvest our first pepper. I don't think I've ever harvested a pepper in May. This is quite a rare treat. Our tomatoes and peppers are growing earlier than they ever have. And this sweet banana pepper is going to make a great addition to this Swiss chard that we're going to saute up tonight for our dinner. So something else I'm going to do before I fertilize is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to remove these lower leaves that didn't get removed earlier in the season because this plant was on the smaller side. I don't leave any leaves below the foot mark. So even like this one, that's kind of halfway hanging below, I'll sometimes I'll just cut it in half if I'm not going to remove the whole leaf. If it's only half of it is hanging low, I'll, I'll cut off half of it. The whole idea is to make sure that the splash when it rains or when you water does not splash on the underside of the leaves, putting blight spores onto the plant, which will then spread throughout and kill your plant. I'm also going to see if there's any lateral stems that I want to use for propagation. I don't see any on this one that looks like ones I would use. Most of them are already covered in flowers or fruit, so I'm going to leave them to grow up into the plant and continue to make an even bigger harvest because I left them. As you can see, it's a tomato jungle in here. <laughs> But I don't have any problems growing this close together as long as I keep those lower branches trimmed off. Now we're in our next tomato bed. These are my favorite, Cherokee Purple, and we have them on the Florida Weave. You see we've been using our jute twine to string them up. I've added another layer since the video where I show you how to do this. But now I can't find my roll of jute twine. <laughs> so every good gardener has to know how to improvise. Bailing twine works in a pinch. So hoping I find that roll of jute twine soon. Don't know how I lost it, but this is gonna work just fine to suit our purposes and our needs. So as the plant grows, you see I'm doing it just every couple of inches. So this plant is going to stay nice and strong and it'll be able to support all of its big heavy fruit that the Cherokee Purple likes to put out. You can see I already have a lot of large fruit growing on these, so I want to make sure that I am keeping them properly tied up. So I'm going to go the opposite way that I went last time, through each plant and around each plant for the perfect support system. I always aim for a leaf node as a good like support brace. Kind of helps hold it in. And if you notice, this plant is crossing over with the one next to it. And so I'm going to make sure that I go in between those plants and keep them good and tied up so that they won't fall over on each other or pull each other down and the fruit won't hurt the, and the fruit won't get too heavy pulling the plant down with it. This bailing twine is a little bit thicker than I'm used to using. A little awkward at first. So I go behind and in front, behind and in front, in the opposite order that I did the last week. Make 
make sure that you pull it tight as you go so that when you get to the end you're not having to pull too hard on the plant and break any branches. So I always go behind and then find my spot and make sure that I'm not going to tug any branches too tight but I also want to make sure that it is very secure and tight so that it will provide the support that this plant is absolutely going to need with these huge fruit. So pulling it slowly and gently to where I need it, making sure it is definitely tight and tying it on. Easy peasy, right? You can see why I love the Florida weave. So easy to maintain. In this bed, you can see the Roma tomatoes are producing crazy and they hardly even need to be tied to a stake. I haven't even had to add any string to this one. And the reason why this one is producing so much fruit at such a small size, part of the reason is because this is a determinate tomato. So a determinate tomato usually will put all of its fruit out at the same time and it will not continue growing and growing and growing like a huge long vine like most of the indeterminate tomatoes do. So this is going to be a nice one to have as an early harvest and I may be able to go back in and put some of my rooted tomatoes that I have been working on and I'll have a video out for you real soon about how to root your tomato cuttings. In this bed I have the early girl. We have big boy in that bed and better boy in this bed. And the big boy is a, a really traditional big slicing tomato. And the better boy is supposed to be a more disease resistant version of the same plant. So we will see if we have a different amount of disease resistance or not. On this early girl, you can see they're almost turning white already. And that means that they're going to start their ripening process sooner than any of these other tomatoes. And that's why they get their name early girl. In this bed, I have some mystery eggplants. I'm assuming they're going to be an Asian eggplant because we got these from the Asian market. At the produce section, they had a few random plants and they didn't have really good labeling. It looked like something that one of the employees had just thrown together and decided to sell at the market. And I was really excited to get some mystery eggplants. And in the next bed, we also have some of their mystery tomatoes. These two tomato beds were planted later than the others. So you can see that we haven't had to do as much of the trimming and pruning, but I do need to come in here and do a good lower pruning on some of these plants but i don't ever like to take more than one third of the plant off as i go it is really cool to see that the flower is already starting to form on these eggplants and they haven't even been in the ground that long now the one big problem that we all have with eggplants i don't care where you live because i've lived all over the country and it's a problem that i've had everywhere i've lived and that is eggplant leaves covered in holes what is that? How come? Why? What are these little black shiny bugs jumping around on my eggplant? Like that guy right there? That is a flea beetle. And these guys wreak havoc on eggplants and other crops. But they only cause physical damage on the leaf. We smush them anytime we see them. We check for them every time we're in the garden. We look for them and we kill them before they can do too much damage. But I've never had an eggplant die from flea beetle. They will look horrible. They will become completely leafless even at times, depending on the level of damage. But they still produce fruit, so I still grow eggplant. <laughs> and I don't like love eggplant and eat it all the time, but when I have it, I really enjoy it. And one of the favorite eggplants I've ever grown is this beauty baby right here. See how tiny it looks? It is because it's going to be a tiny eggplant. It's going to produce tiny fruit. It's called fairy tail. And they're a beautiful light purple, um, almost like variegated striped polka dotted like pattern on their skin. And they're a tiny little eggplant that fits in the palm of my hand. Perfect for grilling in the summer.
And then perhaps one of my most favorite spots in my vegetable garden is over here at the back of the vegetable garden where our thornless blackberries that we planted are growing. And you can see they are covered in fruit. And because we finally got the rain we needed, they are plumping up and turning pink. Before you know it, I'm gonna have black juice dripping off of my chin because I'm gonna be eating so many of these blackberries out here. And my fingers will be so stained. And the strawberries underneath them are still producing a few fruits, but mainly these are gonna be the star of the show any day now. Our last raised bed that we have is the kids garden over here on the side of the house. We have actually moved the kids playground over to this area too. So it has that zone of this is where the kids get to experiment and enjoy and be creative with what they plant. So they have lots of strawberries growing up that they planted from bare root. They're very proud of their strawberries. All of the herbs are doing fantastic in the back. These uh, squash right here are actually a mystery squash from the Asian market. So we shall see what they're gonna produce. And then their tomatoes, you can see how much bigger the leaves are because this is not getting as much sun as the other raised bed garden. But their flowers are doing beautifully. The herbs are doing great. Strawberries are doing great. Tomatoes are actually doing great. They just have really big leaves. Um, I've got a couple more pepper plants that were gifted to us that Rowan's going to plant in here and a few tiny Greek oregano seedlings that we are also going to put in this garden bed. It does need some water even though it just rained. That is the beauty of having raised bed gardens is they do drain well so you don't end up with wet feet because even though we beg for the rain we don't want to drown our plants. <laughs> are in the lower garden the lower garden miss elsie's garden the in-ground garden it hasn't quite found its own name yet but this is it and this is where we're able to do bigger in-ground production so i began making our path with the paper so that we'll be able to come in come harvest time and when we're maintaining these areas this area right here doesn't look like much from afar, but it is actually three very long rows all the way down to the black where Miss Elsie's planting begins. It's all sweet potatoes coming up. So there's sweet potatoes all down these rows and then there's this hill in between. These hills, even though they're full of grass and weeds right now, I'm going to come through with the weed eater, cut that down just because it's too big to, too much of it to have to pull all this. So we're just going to weed eat it down and put in some watermelon and other types of melon seeds in these hills in between and let them grow together kind of like in a permaculture vining beauty where the sweet potatoes can vine together with the watermelon and once the watermelon and melons are done producing for the season we'll be able to pull them up and the sweet potatoes will continue growing all the way to the end of the season. As you can see this is a huge area that we're getting to work in. An area that we haven't had in a long time to be able to plant lots of sweet potatoes, lots of corn, lots of okra, lots of green beans and peppers. And then I have a path coming up this way. Not enough feed bags yet saved up to put down to block out the weeds. I have three rows of 
the Clemson spineless okra. I have been going through and thinning some of them and they are still needing more thinning. And as I go, I weed. You can see I've already done these three rows. They look a little bit cleaner and neater. And when I did these two rows, these are our more rare red okra seedlings. So I tried to transplant any of the babies <laughs> and you can see it kind of failed mostly but some of them did make it I'm sure they will bounce back at least a few of them like right here see this one is the old leaf is gonna die back and we're gonna lose that but you see it's pushing out new growth in the center so this one too so some of them won't make it but some of them will, so. And they needed to be thinned either way. I just hate pulling out the little babies when I'm thinning. I actually have a cup full of the Clemson Spineless in a cup of water that I pulled out because I had nowhere else to put them. And I thought maybe if I put them in water first and get the roots to be a little stronger and then pot them up into little pots, I can share them with neighbors and friends. This area here, uh, we are going to be doing the full moon in June. We'll be planting our peas as Miss Elsie recommended. So there'll be a row of peas here. I might do another section of green beans as a second crop, but we'll see. You can tell I have a lot of work I need to do with the cucumbers because I thought they were old seed and I was right for that pack, but then in that pack, but then this pack and this pack and this pack were not old at all and they took completely. So I soaked these really good last night and I'm going to soak them again really good tonight and try to transplant some of the baby cucumbers from there over to this side. Then I have these rescue peppers. <laughs> I have a friend who has an organic farm locally and when she gets done with all of her planting I always try to sneak over and say hey you got anything left over that's going in the compost that's too late to go in the ground and I was able to get some of these shisito peppers and some red night bell peppers. So I have about 50 in each row, give or take a few. I gave it away to friends, but this is gonna be kind of a crowded pepper area, but it's better than nothing, which is what they would be if they were in the compost. Then you can see that it looks like something was digging in the green bean beds, but that is where I saw holes where seeds didn't come up or they were eaten by something. So I hit the ground to soften it up and I'm going to come back through and drop some more green bean seeds in those openings. So as you can see the corn I've been trying to work on getting the weeds hoed in between. It is a lot of work and it takes a lot out of me to do that level of work so when I got to where it was thicker I kind of gave up, ran out of steam. So I might even come through with the weed eater for those. But the corn has had a little bit of fertilizer put out. I'm going to do another application of high nitrogen fertilizer with our chicken quail litter. That's from our own production that we've harvested and let composted so that it's safe to use. I'm going to hill the corn by mounding up along its edges with some of that nice nitrogen rich fertilizer. So that's our next step for the corn. Have you ever heard the saying, knee high by the 4th of July? I think we've done it. We're going to have knee high by the 4th of June. So that is a promising sign that we got our corn in the ground in time to make sure that we can have an excellent harvest. So you see growing in ground I have a lot more weed competition than I do up in the raised beds. So there's a lot more maintenance that has to be done down here still. I will continue weeding and hoeing and fertilizing and taking care of all of this as well as our raised bed gardens up at the top. It's a big job, but it's one that I'm super excited to have. <sighs> I tell you, the view from my front porch just keeps getting better and better. Come take a look. The beginning of our front yard food forest. So far we don't have a lot planted, but what we do is planted very well Everything has a nice ring of compost and mulch deeply and widely around it. We have fruit trees, 
that are going to be the anchor and the foundation for our amazing permaculture orchard. As you can see in between all of the trees we have left many of the flowers to bloom. These are some false dandelions. When they open they are beautiful dandelion like flowers and then they turn into wishes. Then along the front edge along the road we have a row of 13 blueberries all planted in a nice neat row. You'll notice that the rest of the orchard is not spaced perfectly or in any rows per se because we're trying to achieve two different goals here. One is the view from the road being appealing to passers-by. Most people appreciate rows and straight lines. One of the ways we wish to achieve this is this trench along the front row here is going to be a fence with a trellis. I'll have to draw you a little sketch of it and put it up in the pictures for you so you can get an idea of what I'm talking about. But this trellis is going to house all of our grape and muscadine vines. So this will be grapes and muscadines along the front row and then a nice row of blueberries. And then as we get closer to the porch where it's going to be our view, I want it to be more wild and forest-like. The blueberries have been planted with a nice ring of compost around them. In that compost, we planted some strawberries that we got from a friend. They were transplants, so some of them didn't make it, but we do have some more bare root strawberries to put in around the circles beneath all of the trees and shrubs that we do plant out here. But these blueberries desperately need a nice layer of mulch. So that's the next step in this garden. So right now, this is all meadow still, but over time, we're gonna have other trees and shrubs growing in. They're gonna get thicker and thicker throughout this area. Then we're gonna have layers of perennial and annuals that actually benefit the food forest and help it, whether it's for pollination or for food production, even things that are bioaccumulators like comfrey. These things will be planted all throughout as time goes on. This will be an evolution into a completely different front yard. Creating a sustainable food forest permaculture orchard includes inviting wildlife, whether it's pollinators or birds, to help us with our pest control. Having a water feature, whether it's a pond or a bird bath, is very important for a lot of different creatures to be attracted to your property. These dogwoods over here on this side of the orchard are temporary, unfortunately. If you look, most of them have rotted and decayed all the way down the center main trunks. And there's only these sweet little branches hanging on for dear life. So these dogwoods will have to come out at some point. But we are trying to enjoy them for as long as they are willing to put out beautiful new blooms. But eventually, these will be replaced with fruit producing trees. I think it would make sense that we put some Kusa dogwoods, which have an edible fruit and replaces the beauty that these dogwoods once held for this property. So while it might be best to plant these fruit trees in the fall, we were gifted these in the spring and the spring is the second best time. But we all know the saying goes that the best time to plant a fruit tree is today. So no matter what time of year it is, if you provide the best compost and mulch layers that you can and make sure that they stay watered through the hot season then they're going to do just fine. As you can see these babies are really starting to fill out. Five years from now we are going to be harvesting so much food out of this front yard our family is never going to want for fruit and I cannot wait. I have to say that this has been one of the funnest videos I've made in a long time. To be able to take you guys along with us on our garden tour has been lots of fun. I hope that I've helped show you a little bit of insight on how we monitor, whether it's monitoring for pests or weeds or 
to see what needs to be done, if anything needs to be fertilized, if anything needs mulch. We need to know these things and we need to keep an eye on our gardens every day. And the maintenance that's involved on a daily basis is definitely a pretty big task. But it's one that is so worthwhile and rewarding that it makes it all worthwhile in the end when you get to harvest beautiful Swiss chard and peppers from your garden and looking forward to our future harvests, I can't even imagine how much joy these gardens will bring us. So I hope you come along and join us for more garden tour videos in, in the future. Please check out our Facebook page, Wholesome Roots Passionate Plants. Our Facebook group where we can interact more closely with each other is Wholesome Roots Farmstead Friends. We also have links to all of our other social media, whether it be TikTok, Instagram, in the description of the video down below. You can check out our Amazon wish list and our Amazon store to see what products we suggest using, whether it's in the garden or the kitchen. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our channel. We'll see you next time on Wholesome Roots.